Welcome to Church on the Go. I'm Sammy, and I'll be your host. Church on the Go is a ministry of Messiah Church, offering scripture, a message, and music all in about 30 minutes. We know that you're busy people, but still encourage you to dive into scripture, engage with pastoral teaching, and find a moment to worship while you're, well, on the go. We're in the midst of a sermon series called To Know What Love Is, Unlocking the Power of God's Greatest Gift. Today, Pastor Bethany shares a message called Love Disrupted, and she'll share scripture from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament and the Gospel of John. I hope that you'll stay tuned after the message for a great song from our worship team and to learn a little more about Messiah Church. Welcome, listener. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Pastor Bethany Nelson, and we're going to continue our series this week on To Know What Love Is, Unlocking God's Greatest Gift. You know, this week, Luke and I celebrated 13 years of marriage. We went out for dinner to celebrate, and we went to the kind of restaurant that seated you with strangers, other people dining, for a shared meal and experience. The food was delicious, some of the best I've ever had, and it was meticulously plated. But it turned out that the real treat was experiencing it with others. We were seated next to another couple who were celebrating a birthday. They were also newlyweds, married just two years. Toward the end of our meal together, they asked us, what's your secret for such a long marriage? I'm going to admit, it surprised me. I don't think of ours as a long marriage. My parents have been married over 40 years. My grandparents were married for nearly 70 when my grandpa died. By comparison, ours feels rather short. But it turns out that in the United States, the average marriage ends after just eight years. This is what gives us the phrase, the seven-year itch, I think, and many name that to be a time where marriage is really difficult. One report I read says that while marriage experiences hard times or dissolution for a variety of reasons, commonly it's because of poor communication, poor listening skills, a lack of empathy, and partners having unrealistic expectations of one another. Now, Friendships fare slightly better, with the average friendship lasting around 10 years. As it turns out, the deterioration of friendship is often due to the same struggles in communication, empathy, and expectation. At the same time, when asked, people will overwhelmingly say that their relationships, whether marriage, family, or friendships, are the most important things in their lives. And numerous studies point us to the same conclusion that often the secret to a happy or a long life is maintaining good and close friendships. So how does our lived reality veer so far away from our desires and our longing for close and healthy relationships? St. Augustine was one of the great theologians and philosophers of Western Christianity. He set out to answer this very question. He had read Cicero, who had concluded in some of his writings that, quote, Every person sets out to be happy, but the majority are thoroughly wretched. Turns out the people living around the year 400 had the same basic struggles as we do in 2024. Augustine set out to discover why most people felt so discontent. His conclusion was that for most of us, our lives are lived out of order, that we have disordered our love. That is what we love, becomes out of order with how or who we love. Augustine was convinced that what defines a person more than anything is what they love. But sometimes we get off track. He named this disordered love. And by that, he meant that we often love less important things more and more important things less than we should. And this wrong prioritization leads to unhappiness and disorder in our lives. Now, I want to pause, pause, excuse me, I want to pause briefly before exploring this any further and say this. Sometimes the dissolution of a relationship is the right thing. Sometimes the ending of a relationship is the way we will find ourselves experiencing healing and happiness within ourselves or with others. Sometimes our love becomes reordered by the ending of a relationship, but also Many times, when we struggle in relationships with God, with family and friends, with colleagues, it's because we've gotten off track and our priorities or love 
have gotten temporarily out of order. So this is our focus today. How do we keep our love in order so that we can experience all the blessings of a well-loved life? Jesus teaches us that the most important thing is that we first love God and then love our neighbor as ourselves. And following our love of God and our love of others is the love of all the other important things in our life, our meaningful work, our hobbies, our travel, and the like. But sometimes our love gets disrupted and we find ourselves loving things or experiences before people or even find our love of God taking a back seat. Augustine defined sin as disordered love. When we fail to love God first and ourselves secondly, when we instead place other things like the love of sports or travel, of money or success, when we put these things first, Augustine says this is where we stumble and find troubles in maintaining our relationships and finding happiness or contentment in life. It isn't that all of these other aspects in life aren't good. It's just that if we find ourselves in a place where our love of God and one another is not the primary, that we will struggle. My guess is that all of us, at one point or another, have experienced disordered love. Often it happens slowly and unintentionally. We might, for example, believe that our best friend or partner is the most important relationship, but then our calendars are filled with appointments and meetings Our time together becomes fleeting and we're zoned out watching a show or scrolling on our phones or even passively talking about our days rather than connecting when we find us together anyway. And suddenly we find that our behaviors aren't aligned with our intentions, our values or desires. A number of years ago, when my kids were little, I found myself feeling really lonely. Now, if you would have looked at my calendar, It wouldn't seem like I would have time to feel lonely. I was really busy. I was busy with play dates and church and community events, even with date nights and time with friends. But I realized that while I desired intimacy and connection with my people, my time was actually spent with just a lot of busyness. How often has someone asked you, how have you been? And your first response is, busy. A busy life doesn't always mean a happy one, right? Sometimes the culprit of this is that our love has gotten out of order. Our behaviors or activities have become misaligned with our priorities. And that's precisely where I found myself. My life had gotten out of order. It was busy, but I was lonely because I was prioritizing the wrong things. I was missing out on real connection. I felt isolated, even though I was hardly ever alone. Do you know what I mean? As you maybe know by now, one of my core beliefs is that God has made us to be in community. We are made to receive and give love, to experience God's gifts through relationships with others. And when we recognize that we've gotten off track, God invites us to try again. Sometimes this means seeking forgiveness. Sometimes it means pausing or changing, redirecting our behaviors And sometimes it means simply reprioritizing who and how we love. In that season, when my love had gotten out of order, my calendar was full, but my heart was lonely, God called me to be more intentional about how I spent my time. And so I reached out to a few girlfriends who were also clergy, and I asked them, what if we dedicated one long afternoon a month to connect? I was clear in my goals. I wanted intentional and thoughtful time. And it turns out I wasn't the only busy person feeling alone. So we began to meet every month and we took turns checking in. We gave the honest answer, not the polite answer. And we would name what we struggled with, where we were finding joy, what we were learning and working on. We've been meeting as a group for five years. And this group of friends has become a priority and a lifeline. I mark that time together as sacred. And even though sometimes when we're together, it's tempting to give the easy answer, I've learned that it's always more fruitful to give the real one. In our reading from 1 John today, uh, we're going to hear this. Don't love the world or the things in the world. Everything that is in the world, the craving for what the body feels, the craving for what the eye see, and the arrogant pride in one possession, these are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world and its cravings are passing away, but the person who does the will of God 
remains forever. What I think this passage is saying, practically speaking, is that the things that keep us busy are not always the things that bring us joy. The pressures of our daily lives to succeed in our careers, to have the cleanest house or the nicest car, even our desire for our kids to have it all. These pressures are not the behaviors that will lead us to a joyful life. In fact, sometimes these pressures can distract or alienate us from the people who are most important. Early in my career, I met with a man who had had an incredible career as an educator. By any measure, he was successful. He'd won awards. He'd become a sought-after speaker. He was well-respected in his field. But he told me, as he neared the end of his life, that he had a lot of regrets because all of that success came with a cost. He rarely shared a meal with his family. He missed many of his kids' games and events. He spent vacations working, unable to fully unplug. He became disconnected from his church. The cost, he said, was that while his career was successful, his relationships, especially those with his children, suffered. And over time, they lost touch and now rarely spoke. With the wisdom that comes with age, he realized he had loved out of order. By spending his life chasing his love of his career, he placed his love of God and family secondary, and they suffered for it. He told me that day, the work can wait. My kids don't care about my awards. They cared that I missed out on their life. Now, he had worked his whole life to support his family. His work was a sign of his love, but what he missed was the opportunity to connect and prioritize them, those whom he loved. Some of these things uh, that John names things of this world are necessary, of course. It's how we make our lives, it's how we pay for our homes, support ourselves and our family, and a lot of times they can bring us a, a great amount of joy. It's not wrong to love your work or to work hard or to have flourishing hobbies, but what John reminds us is that all of these things are meant to be supporting characters in our lives. They are meant to support our primary call to love God and love one another. Now, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus desires that our lives are not only busy, but are fulfilled and abundant in experiencing the gifts of God. These gifts include knowing in our heart that God loves us, experiencing that love with one another in community, with our care, our time, the investment of ourselves. You know, at the end of their life, people most often speak of the people they love, the pets they cherished, the faith they nurtured, the people and organizations with whom they served that made an impact in the world. These are what they name as signs of an abundant life. They rarely speak of things that fill our calendars or the cleanliness of their homes or even the successes in their careers. These things might support the best parts of their lives, but rarely are they the best thing themselves. The challenge, of course, is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. Now, in Deuteronomy, book chapter 11, we read this. Now, if you completely obey God's commands that I am giving you right now by loving the Lord your God and by serving him with all your heart and all your being, then God will provide rain for your land at the right time. God will also make your fields lush for your livestock, and you will eat and be satisfied. In these verses, we're reminded that when our love is in the right order, we will experience an abundant and joyful life. In the words of the author, your fields will be lush, you will eat and be satisfied. In other words, when you live in order, the rest of your life will flourish. It will all fall into place. When you keep your love of God and one another as a primary, everything will come together for the good. You will have greater purpose. Your relationships will flourish. Your dreams and goals for life will come into greater focus because your priorities, your love, is in order This is the abundant life that Jesus promised. A life that is centered in love will also have more joy, peace, and contentment. So how do we do this? Now, just a couple of verses later, in the same chapter of Deuteronomy, we hear this. Place these words I'm speaking on your heart and in your very being. Tie them on your hand as a sign. They should be on your forehead as a symbol. Teach them to your children by talking about them when you're sitting down And when you are out and about, when you are lying down and when you're getting up, 
write them on your house's door frame and on your city gates. What I hear from this is, is saying, keep God's love in front. Keep it around you and make it an everyday part of your life. Make it how you begin your day and how you end it and how you center your words and actions throughout. Now, this morning, I want to give you five simple practices that I think will help you keep your love of God and one another central to your life. These might sound familiar to you because they are also the same five practices we ask every member at Messiah Church to commit to. And that's because we believe these practices are how we keep our love aligned. And when doing so, our faith, our relationships, and our lives will flourish. So here here they are. Worship, pray, serve, give, and witness. Let's talk briefly about each one. First up, worship. That is to make worship a regular part of your life. It might mean worshiping in person or online or right here with our Church on the Go podcast. It might also mean making worship a daily part of your life by reading scripture, listening for God's wisdom, and singing along to a worship song. When we worship, we are making intentional time to place our love of God first. We're opening ourselves to be changed and transformed by God, setting the foundation for how we love one another and center our lives. This is why we as your pastors at Messiah try to make worship so accessible by offering it online, on the app, on this podcast, as well as having daily devotionals, our GPS study guide, to help you worship and grow in faith each and every day. Secondly, we ask people to pray every day and frequently. When we pray, we are making it a priority to listen to God, to ask forgiveness, and to strengthen our relationship with Jesus. And prayer, when coupled with these other vows, is how we invest and nurture our relationship with God. I think it also teaches us how to be in relationship with others, because when we practice asking forgiveness from God, we learn how to ask and offer it to one another. When we practice focusing on our conversation with God, we learn how to give our best attention to others. And when we practice bringing our whole selves to God in prayer, sharing our joys and celebrations, but also our worries and fears, we lay the groundwork for being open and vulnerable with others. We learn the importance and the practice of connection, which in turn strengthens our spiritual lives, but also our relationships with one another. It increases our our awareness, our compassion, and empathy, all that help us live more abundant lives. Okay, now third, we ask folks to serve. We invite people to serve both inside and outside of the church. This is how we put our faith or our love into action. It's how we keep our love not just something we feel or something we say, but to make sure it's also something we do. And by serving, we keep at the forefront the second part of the great commandment, that is to love others as ourselves. Fourth, we ask people to give. And what we mean here is to invite people to live with a spirit of generosity, to love God and others by giving of our finances, but also of giving of our time, our energy, our gifts. We practice sharing the abundant life of Jesus with one another. It's how we partner with God in making God's kingdom dreams come true. It's how we invest in future generations, how we care for the poor, how we protect the vulnerable, how we love our earth. Jesus says in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The way we spend our money, the way we fill up our calendars, the way we share our gifts and talents, they all tell a story. As followers of Jesus, we are invited to tell a story of love. What does the story of your home budget or your personal calendar tell? Does it speak of a life aligned with love of God and one another? Or does it tell a story of disordered love, forgetfulness, foolishness, or busyness? Now, lastly, we invite every member to make a promise to make a witness. In other words, tell your story. How has the love of God made a difference in your life? How has Messiah Church impacted your life? How does the love of Christ alive in you give you an abundant life? I know this can be scary, but when we tell our story, we're telling people about the power of love. 
We're inviting them to be changed and transformed. And when we tell our story, we keep fresh our commitment to love. Bearing witness about what's most important helps us keep all these other practices too, so that our love stays a priority. All right, there you go. Worship, prayer, service, giving, and witness. Five spiritual practices God invites us into so that our love can remain in right order. When we center our days around these practices, our love of God and our love for one another stays in focus. And with it, we will experience abundant life. And so if you're listening today and you're feeling like, ah, man, I really know what disordered love feels like. If you're feeling like your priorities have gotten mixed up or your life is more busy than peaceful, more self-focused than other-focused, if you're feeling alone or lost or discouraged, I want to try to encourage you to focus on these five practices every day this week. And then notice, how has your love been reordered? How has your life been given focus? Where do you experience abundance? And while the book of Deuteronomy suggests placing God's word on your forehead or on your doorpost, this week some of my friends at Messiah made a graphic for you that you can use as a wallpaper on your phone. It's a little daily reminder for you to every day spend time with these practices of worship, prayer, service, giving, and witness. You can find these on our website or in the Messiah Church app on the resources tab. Friends, you are loved. May you know it, may you share it, and may you have it abundantly. Please pray with me. God of life, God of love, you have called us to follow you and to experience a good and abundant life. Help us to keep our love for you and one another a priority. Give us focus, patience, and confidence to know that even when we've gone astray, that your love for us is strong, calling us toward you once again. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, beloveds, I invite you to stay with me now for this time of reflection as we hear a song from our worship band. Looking out my window, feeling the crescendo, sunset on a quiet sea. Sitting with the ones that I'll forever love, we're waiting on a flash of green. And even when my legs got cold, you have always held me close. You're the only rock that I could ever stand on You're the only one for me The sun goes up, the sun comes down This old world going and round I'm here traveling down this long and winding road Seasons come and seasons go They take me high and leave me low But I'm still standing on the only rock I know You're my cornerstone
Thank you for joining us for Church on the Go. I hope that you found something inspiring today to carry with you into the week ahead. To learn more about Messiah Church, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram using the handle at MessiahChurchMN. You can also find us online at MessiahChurch.org. If you found something inspiring in the message today, I sure encourage you to share this podcast with your family and friends.